Hi, I'm Dennis DiCicco, Senior Editor of Sky and Telescope Magazine here at the 2011 Advanced Imaging Conference AIC in Santa Clara, California. And right now I'm talking with Egan Derbel, the owner and CEO of Astro Systems Austria, ASA, makers of very high-end imaging equipment. Egan, I know you've got some new things here and you want to show me what you've got? Yes, we have many new correctors for several telescope types here. It's a small one yeah. for schmidt cassegrain is a reduce and flattener. Sensors going bigger and bigger. And so you need every time a flattener and yeah. best also for a short exposure a, a reducer. Okay, so these are for standard F10 schmidt cassegrain yes. telescopes. It's a reducer. What's it bring? The, what's the reducing factor? Uh, 77%. Okay, so it brings the F10 point. down to an F7.7. Yeah, yes. And it's also a corrector. It corrects yes. the, the comb in the system. Yes. Gives you a nice flat field. And it will cover what size chip? Up to APS format. A APS. So ideal for Kodak 8 and 300 and up to DSLR, like the Canon and so on. Oh, very good. All right, so what are some of the other ones you have here? Yes. What is this? This is a RC a reducer and flattener. All right, so this is for a Ritchie creation system. Yes. And it's a combination of a focal Flat. reducer. And what's the factor on it? It's a 084, and the second one we have 070. OK, so you have two different factors. And it also is a corrector that will flatten the field. Yes. How big an imaging circle? 16 millimeters. 60, so this will cover the largest CCD chips that are out there, the 16803s. Do you have field flatteners, just regular field flatteners for Ritchie creations? Yes, of course there is. Yeah, this 4 inch flattener for 80 millimeters corrected field. So this will give an 80 millimeter diameter corrected field, once again, for the largest chips. Yes. And are these made for basically all Ritchie creation telescopes? Yes. And, and you had told me something a little bit before about how special you go to the effort to get these absolutely right. In fact, you said before that these are actually designs that have been scaled down from things that you're doing for meter class telescopes, right? Yes. Uh, the technology is founded by the uh, very professional uh, correctors in the meter class. It's up to six or eight uh, inch di diameters. For the and field. Yes. For, yes. And so we make it a little bit smaller for the amateurs but with the same quality and technology. So you had told me before that you actually custom make these depending on the optical glass that you get. Yes, of every charge, what we make the lenses, we uh, order the glass and then we measure the index and correct the design to this index so that we can reach really the design, the theoretical design. So in other words, when you get your Perform. glass, you get your glass, you measure the index of refraction to know exactly what you've got, and then you will custom modify the design, and is that both the design on the glass as well as all the, where the elements go? Yes, of course, also the spacers, and also for uh, got a little bit greater, a little bit smaller, and also the shape of the lens. So these things are a really custom design based on the materials that you get to make them out of. Yes. And is that across the line on all of these? Across? Yes, across the line, all the correctors here you see. All right, so you've got correctors. Let me see, you've got a standard classical cast system. That's a four inch, so that's got an 80 millimeter imaging circle. Yeah. All right, and then you've got wind correctors here, and these are for Newtonian telescopes? Yes, for okay. Newtonian telescopes. And they're down to, like, what F value? It's a perfect comma corrector. And so you can also support a field of 60 millimeters for the big sensors. For the big, big chips. Yes. And these are for like what F ratio systems? Uh, it's going up from 3.5 up to 5 or 6. 5 or 6. So you've got a 4 inch corrector for the big one and then you've got smaller correctors as well. Yes. You've got a 3 inch corrector. It's a reducer. It's a reducer as well so yes. that speeds up the system. Yeah. And that's a factor of 0.73. You've got another one that's a 0.95 reducer. So you've got quite a line of, of correctors here. Yes, of course, because uh, astrophotography needs really good correctors to have the best uh, images. So I know you have more than correctors here. You want to show me some of the other things that you have? Yes, our direct drive mounts. OK. For in this case, you can talk with the famous astro imager Wolfgang Bromper. Okay. Hi, Dennis. Uh, what I'd like to do is show you some other stuff. Uh, 
starting with the small mounts, the astrographs go into the bigger equipment. Good. Yeah? Let's go take a look at the little okay. ones first. Good. All right. So what do we got here? Okay, this is our new baby. This is a 80-inch uh, hyperbolic astrograph. Um, we have a line of astrographs starting from 8-inch going up to 20-inch, which are basically Newtonians, yeah, with wind correctors. This one is a different thing. It is a hyperbolic design, yeah. Um, so you've got a hyperbolic primary mirror. It's got a hyperbolic primary mirror and a special corrector for that, yeah. And what's the advantage of the hyperbolic design? The advantage of the hyperbolic design compared to the Newtonian is you have better spot sizes, you have a bigger corrected field, yeah, and you have less vignetting. So you've got a larger corrected field. How you've big got a field larger will this field. Well, this one covers 60 millimeters easily, yeah. Okay, so you can use this with the large chip cameras, yeah, the 16 ab Absolutely. I mean, you can, you can uh, put the large cameras on the Newtonians too, yeah, but you get a little bit of lignetting, um, and the spot sizes are probably not that perfect in the edge, yeah, for the real big sensors, yeah. That is the advantage, advantage of the hyperbolic. All right, you know? so how big a scope? You're making the 8-inch in a hyperbolic, you're making yeah, larger yeah, ones yeah. also? No, not yet. Just the 8-inch for Just now? Just the 8-inch. So yeah. that's a whole special system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, that's nice. And you said you have 8-inch. What are the sizes in the Newtonian? The, the Newtonians are 8-inch, 10-inch, 12-inch, 16-inch, and 20-inch. All the way up to 20 inches. Up to 20 inches, and they are f3.6, yeah. Uh, the hyperbolic is F3, yeah. F3. So that is another advantage. Yeah, it's a little bit faster, you know. A little bit faster. Wow, yeah. those are nice yeah. systems. Okay. All right. You want to tell me a little bit about the mount? Yeah, I'd love to tell you something about the mounts. So, this is the smallest one we have. This is the DDM60. It's um, very good for field use. Very portable. And the thing about that mount is they are direct drive. You don't have any gears. So actually, uh, the axe of the mount is the rotating part the only rotating part of a, of a motor, yeah? You just have two bearings, you have the motor in here, yeah? So you don't have any backlash, you don't have any periodic error, you don't have any unperiodic error, yeah? So it's a very smooth thing, you know? Um, Plus you can drive it virtually any speed you want with your computer software, right? You can do, you know, uh, that is the good thing. I mean, the, the, the difficult thing, and that is the reason why these mounts just came up uh, the last couple of years, you know, is that it was not easy yet yeah, to get a motor that makes one rotation in 24 hours, and that's very exact. So you need high resolution encoders, yeah, um, and you need a lot of feedback uh, from the software, yeah, so it's software control, yeah, the encoders tell the motor moves, yeah, and the encoder tells uh, how the position is and it corrects, and that happens a few hundred times a second, you know. A few hundred times a, few a hundred second? A few hundred times a second, yeah. So we have a very accurate mount here, you know. Um, and that is not the only thing. The thing is we have a full modeling software, so when you set up the mount, yeah, uh, I mean, you can use it like any normal mount, yeah? I don't think that has come across to, to everyone, yeah? You can just set it up, pull a line, yeah, and use it with an auto guider like any mount. Just like yeah? any German equatorial mount. Yeah, you can use it like that. But then you miss a lot of the benefits, you know? We have a full modeling software, yeah? So you set up the mount, do a pointing model, yeah? Uh, we even got an uh, uh, easy way of polar adjusting in the software. You do a small pointing model, see three or four stars, yeah, and then just center a star in the south, press move for polar alignment, the star moves out of the center, yeah, and you just adjust it that, so that it goes back to the center, yeah, and then you polar align. It takes you something like two or three minutes, you know. That's all. But that's that's why all you, you said have to do, you know, and you're pretty well polar aligned, yeah. And from then on, you could do a pointing model. The pointing model accounts for the rest of polar alignment error that you always have, but because you can't mm -hmm. align to zero. Then for collimation error, which means uh, col not, collimation error is not optical collimation. It's uh, where the telescope points compared to the mount. So yeah? when, when the telescope optical axis yeah, isn't perfectly aligned to the absolutely, mount. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And the other thing it accounts for is uh, mount angle. Uh, you always have a mount angle because this is uh, how the axes are together. It should be 90 degrees, yeah, but in a real world, yeah, you never get 90 degrees, yeah. So it corrects for that, yeah. Then you have tube flex east, tube flex west, and over that, yeah, we have the Fourier parameters, yeah, which can correct for something like 
bearing sinus, you know, and things like that. And even for a kind of typical flexure in the telescope, yeah? So you get a very good pointing. With my telescope, yeah, I usually get something below 10 arc seconds RMS over the whole sky. Yeah? So in other words, when you do a go-to, yep, you yep, yep. end up within 10 arc seconds of where yep, you want to be. Absolutely, yeah. So Wherever I point at in the sky, you know. Uh, and that's not only for the pointing, that is also for the tracking, you know. Because you ta can't take those two things apart. A mount that points good will track good, you know. Because the same corrections that are applied they are not only applied to the pointing, they are applied to the tracking, you know? So this means it accounts for when you're tracking, it's not only moving the polar axis, but also the declination yeah, it axis? Does, all the time. So it's know? compensating? It's compensating all these errors. All yeah. the errors based on the pointing model. Based on the pointing model. So based on the pointing model, this is yeah. correcting both the right ascension and the declination. It does, yeah. yeah. So this yeah. allows yeah. you to do basically unguided yeah. astrophotography. Yeah. I mean, I routine, routinely now go everything under 10 minutes, yeah, and I have a scope with 4.5 meters focal length, yeah, I go unguided, you know. It's so easy, you just point the telescope and you shoot, you know. Um, I mean, the thing is, you need a stiff telescope, yeah. Um, if you have a telescope that has large errors in itself, like mirror shift or things like that, yeah, then that probably can get a little bit more problematic, yeah. But we got a nice tool for that too, you know. Uh, well, imagine, imagine you have a pointing model. You made a pointing model. Um, say you have a permanent setup. If you have a permanent setup, then you make a pointing model, yeah, and you probably use it for a couple of months, yeah. But there are things that change, temperature changes, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. That doesn't do that much bad on the pointing model, yeah, but it might degrade the tracking. Now, if you have a telescope, yeah, uh, well, our telescopes are pretty stable. They're carbon fiber, yeah, this telescope is steel and carbon fiber, you know, they're very, very stable. Well, for instance, imagine you have a schmidt cassegrain grain with a primary mirror focuser, yeah? Mm -hmm. Then it is prone to mirror flip, yeah, and probably more prone to changes with temperature, yeah? Sure. And we have a good feature for that. It's called local pointing, yeah? So you have your pointing model, yeah? And even if you go out in the field, yeah, uh, you can use that, yeah? You go to the object you want to image, yeah? And then you use the local pointing feature. What happens then is the mount moves the scope along that path you want to image, yeah? It moves it along and then moves it back. That is the first thing to settle the optics, yeah? And the next thing it does, it takes pointing exposures along that track, yeah? So it makes a pointing model just for the track that you're yeah. going to use? Absolutely, to yes it does, yeah? So you just put in the software how long you want to image, yeah? Say 100 minutes, 180 minutes, whatever, and how many pointing exposures you want on that path, yeah? From experience, I tested that whole thing quite a lot. You don't need that much, you will do with four or five, you know? And that goes pretty fast. Yeah, and then you got that pointing model. Yeah, for the path you want to image. Now imagine the telescope moved along that path and it's settled already. Yeah. So now if you have a telescope that is prone to things like that, yeah, you will benefit. You know, because it's already settled. Yeah, and you done done that on that path. Yeah, you know, same hum hum humidity. Yeah, not much temperature change. Yeah, you done it immediately. Yeah. And with that, with my system, with the 4.5 meters, I managed, even with my system, I managed to do 20 minutes unguided, you know, which I think is spectacular, you know. So this is the advantage of having these direct drive mounts yeah, in the computer yeah, control. Yeah, yeah, you can yeah. model these things and make yeah, these long exposures, yeah. things that, that you normally couldn't deal with in a, yeah. just a regular tracking mount. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, you know, that's uh, such a beautiful, it makes things so easy. Yeah? Now imagine in spring you're shooting galaxies, yeah? We all know the problem of finding a guide star, yeah? Beside one of those galaxies, yeah? You always ran into trouble, you needed to reframe or you needed to rotate your field, yeah? Just to get that off-axis guide star. You don't have to do that with that, you know? Because you just frame your object the way you want, yeah? And it saves you a lot of time, you know? In the end. Yeah, yeah. Now you yeah. mentioned your four your four meter telescope. I know you've got a sample here. You want to show me a little bit about this? Yeah, yeah. So basically, uh, that is pretty much the same as the one I'm using. This is a F15 RC. 
uh, but the construction is pretty much the same. The one I'm using is a F9 20 inch Cassegrain. 20 with, inch F9 Cassegrain. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It is four point, almost 4.5 meters, yeah, close to 4.5 meters. Uh, and it is a field corrector, and we have 80 millimeters of corrected field, yeah. It's a very solid telescope, yeah. It has a secondary focuser. It has a rotator on here, and the good thing with the secondary focus, so we all know, is that you can put a lot of weight on in the back, yeah, and you don't have any fluctuations, yeah, because everything is mounted totally solid. Solidly you know? attached yeah, to the back of the absolutely, telescope. Absolutely, yeah. So your secondary, you 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 do your focusing by moving the secondary yeah, back and absolutely, forth. Absolutely, yeah. Very good. Yeah, we have fans uh, that uh, blow across the mirror, which I think are very important to get rid of the boundary layer that sticks on the mirror, yeah, especially with high resolution imaging. That is always a problem, yeah. As long as the telescope isn't cooled down, yeah, you have to get rid of that boundary layer. We have uh, fans in the back to cool the mirror down. Um, Egan was saying earlier that the yep. technology that they're using is trickling down from the professionals. That's it another is, example absolutely. of it. Absolutely. The whole construction, you know, I know that a lot of manufacturers uh, prefer aluminum, yeah? But uh, this is basically a downscaled version of what the pros use, yeah? And they go with steel, you know, mm -hmm. solid steel constructions, yeah? Nice the thermal region. expansion of steel is, by the way, lower than aluminum, you know? So. Um, you want to very quickly tell me something about the mount here? Yeah. I know this is your biggest direct okay, drive mount. Yeah. This is the largest one. This is the DDM 160. Uh, the name comes from the diameter of the axis. Yeah, 160 means 16 centimeter axis. Yeah? Okay. It's got a weight capacity of about 700 pounds. Yeah. So actually, you probably could sit on that. You know. <laughs> Um, I know you have some examples in your literature that shows uh, a mount with this with two 14-inch yeah, yeah, telescopes, one on each side. telescopes like that on it, you know. Uh, the way the pier is designed, and we have that for the medium mount too, is so that you avoid the meridian flip, yeah? You can just swing through, yeah? Uh, that is the good thing here, because if you have a normal pier, you need to flip the meridian, you don't need to have that okay. here, yeah? And for a lot so, of the sky, you can swing the yeah, telescope yeah, all the yeah, way underneath yeah. it. You cover most of the sky without the need to, without the need to flip, you know? Uh, Technology-wise, yeah, it's just uh, bigger. All our mounts use the same software, yeah? So if someone gets a small amount, yeah, mm -hmm. um, he gets everything the same, yeah? All the possibilities, you know? All uh, the corrections, all the everything. All yeah? the features are there's, built in. There's, it's not that the big amounts have other features. They all have the same features. It's just the weight capacity. All right. So Wolfgang, I want to thank you very much for showing me everything that you've got here. I appreciate it. And Egan, thank you very much for telling me everything. If people want more information about this, they can turn to your website. Yes, www.astrosysteme.com. AT. AT for Austria. I'm Dennis DiCicco, Senior Editor for Sky and Telescope here at AIC 2011.